Before I start the show, I want to give a shout out to Lisa Calloway, who left an awesome review on iTunes. To answer your question, Lisa, if I gained the shawl, I would absolutely choose White Aja. But I'm such a lazy student that realistically I'd be taught just enough not to melt my face off and then sent home, a la Else Grinwell. If you have never heard me beg for reviews because you stop listening as soon as the outro music starts, what are you even doing? There's an easter egg at the end of every show, and sometimes they're even funny. Anyway, Seth and Aradia from Watt Spoilers said I should beg for reviews before the show starts, and while I'm doing that, I'll thank Bloody Moo Moo, Gleam and Twitch, and Veggie Daniel for their lovely words. They're appreciated. The stone won't fall until the podcast of the dragon comes to your device. Hey everybody, my name is Morgan. I'm open to suggestions as to what I should do with this part of my intro. Welcome to the 39th episode of Podcast of the Dragon. How do I heal get comfortable having a wetlander for a boss? Uncomfortably. In this episode, I look at Rand as he takes his people back, ponder how they come to terms with him, and explore his induction into a sorority as he unintentionally ships himself with Avienda. One of the greatest assets that the dragon has in his journey to fight the shadow are the Aegeal, and The Fires of Heaven is the book where Rand works to not just bring them together, but to earn their regard. And this is a far more difficult task than it might seem from the outside looking in, because however much a wetlander looks at the folk in Cadden Soar and sees a uniform collective, the Aiel are not one people, and RJ tries to show that by grouping them in many different ways. It's not just that he breaks them up into twelve clans, of which we only get some superficial exploration, mostly of extremes, from the Tardad, Steadfast, and Loyal, and there with Ran from the first on one end, to the Shido, renegades who pervert the traditions they claim to hold dear on the other, and then, for simplicity's sake, Jordan divides the rest of the clans into those that join with Rand before he fights the Shido at Kyrian, and those that wait until after to see who the victor is. And obviously there has to be individual culture and nuance amongst the clans, but an oblivious wetlander, so every single one of the POVs that we're in, isn't going to pick up on those kinds of subtleties when the culture is already so different and strange, and it's not important or interesting enough to be exploring it narratively, not unless the story were much more zoomed in and particularly focused on the Aegeal. And since a clan is a family, and family ties are not based in a mutual philosophy, it's not useful or meaningful to examine a relationship with the Aegeal through the lens of clans. Instead, RJ explores Rand's attempts to build cooperation with other divisions of Aegeal, those held together with similar goals like wise ones and chiefs, and Jordan also shows how warrior societies, how the men and the maidens, grow to accept Rand in different ways. Rand presumably comes to terms with the truth of his Aiel origin off-screen. We see him accept that Tam is not his dad at the end of Book 2. Letting Tam go is how he transitions into declaring himself the dragon. But there's no narrative exploration of him following a line of thought from Tam isn't my father, I'm the dragon, to born of a maiden on the spear on the slopes of Dragonmount. That said, it's not a difficult conclusion to draw. Everybody says he looks like an Aegeal. And when he sees Aegeal for the first time, the maidens of the spear trading for Sung Wood and steading Sofu when he, Matt, Perrin, and Varen and Inktar go to ask the elders if they can use the waygate to follow Padden Fane to Toman Head, 
Perrin makes a comment like, Sung Wood, bullshit, they're looking for he who comes with the dawn. And Matt tells Rand, they're looking for you, and relays the story of running into Urien and Kinslayer's dagger. And it says, And since you're the only Aiel we know, he finished, Well, it could be you. Inktar says Aiel never live outside the way, so you must be the only one. I don't think that's funny, Matt, Rand growled. I am not an Aiel. The Amaralyn said you are. Inktar thinks you are. Tam said... He was sick, fevered. They had severed the roots he had thought he had, the ice at eye and Tam between them, though Tam had been too sick to know what he was saying. They had cut him loose to tumble before the wind, then offered him something new to hold on to. False dragon. I yield. He could not claim those for roots. He would not. Maybe I don't belong to anyone, but the Two Rivers is the only home I know. So maybe Rand drew the conclusion that he was Aigil off-screen after the end of Book 2. Or maybe he was working his way through it as he was traveling from the Mountains of Mist to Tyr in Book 3. Or maybe it didn't fully occur to him until Aiel coincidentally show up the night that the stone falls and aid him in taking it. Or more accurately, they take it and create the distraction that helps him get in, not coordinating with him, just looking for he who comes with the dawn, this guy of our blood but raised by those not of our blood. Regardless, all the pieces fall into place, and lo and behold, there they are. And Rand, especially because the Aigil come with a provisional loyal army, accepts them and begins to work them into his plans. And, presumably by that point, if not before, acknowledges that he is one of them. So, in Book 4, as Rand and Matter returning from Roydian, Rand is ruminating about what he has just seen and his fate. And it says, Upslope, the Aigil was stirring in the three camps. The cold fact was he needed them. That was why he had begun to contemplate this back when he first discovered that the dragon reborn and he who comes with the dawn might well be one and the same. He needed people he could trust. People who followed from something besides fear of him or greed for power. People who did not mean to use him for their own ends. He had done what was required, and now he would use them. Because he had to. Rand really appreciates their loyalty, but he has a sense of detachment toward them. Their culture and ways are so very strange, and so he struggles to identify with the ideal. And because he resents the fact that everybody has been pushing with this, you look like an ideal. If you wrapped a shufa around your head, you'd be the image of an idealman. Moraine and Lon want to say you're from the two rivers, but, you know. He immediately digs in his heels against that and has no real desire to identify with ideal. The wise ones sense this ambivalence that he has right away. Rand has an immediately contentious relationship with them. And honestly, a lot of that is Moraine's fault. He sees that they can channel, and so that makes them Aes Sedai in his mind, no matter what. And he does not trust Aes Sedai. And while he knows that they aren't actually Aes Sedai, they are bossy women who have positions of power and are used to telling people what to do and take for granted that they will be obeyed. And that puts his back up. He's done being pushed around, and so he is instantly wary of them and unwilling to listen and not about to put up with their bullshit. The Wise Ones are pragmatic people for Aiel. Aiel live by a philosophy that is often more ideal than sense, and it's almost like to be a Wise One you have to rise above it. And in Rand, they see a strange and stubborn boy who is going to be a gigantic headache, and they have to figure out how to work with him, or perhaps more importantly, coax him into working with them to make it so that the Aiel can survive this transition. Rand returns from Roydian and he's immediately pushing their buttons and essentially telling them, guess what, you don't get to make the rules anymore. I'm making the rules. He starts asking Rourke questions and the Dreamwalkers are like, hey, you have to send Matt and Egwene away because people don't talk about Roydian. And he's like, guess what? I'm talking about Rodian right now, right here, and I don't give a shit what you like. And so he's continuing to push these things, and they're getting super upset. And part of his belligerence is that he's concerned about more rain, not having returned from Rodian yet. He's got plans he wants to make. He's got to move, and so he doesn't want to have to wait. So he's like, how long is she going to be there? Maybe we should send somebody after her. And Malayne gets really frustrated with him. They've been trying to get him to eat, and so she throws a piece of bread at his head and is more or less, you fucking asshole, I should have let you starve. And because he's angry and hurting and frustrated, he kind of lashes out at her and asks her, why do you want me to live? You know, you heard what the Aes Sedai and the Tarangriel said. You know that I am your doom. And it says, it was Bear who spoke. 
Everyone thinks they know the prophecy of Roydian, but what they know is what wise ones and clan chiefs have told them for generations. Not lies, but not the whole truth. The truth might break the strongest man. What is the whole truth? Rand insisted. She glanced at Matt, then said, In this case, the whole truth, the truth known only to wise ones and clan chiefs before this, is that you are our doom. Our doom and our salvation. Without you, no one of our people will live beyond the last battle. Perhaps not even until the last battle. That is prophecy and truth. With you, he shall spill out the blood of those who call themselves Aiel as water on sand, and he shall break them as dried twigs, yet the remnant of a remnant shall he save, and they shall live. A hard prophecy, but this has never been a gentle land. She met his gaze without flinching. And so while Rand doesn't feel great about it, the idea of being anyone's doom is super distressing to him, he's starting to learn to trust prophecy. So he gives himself permission to use these warriors, and the wise ones are determined to do everything they can to steer and influence, because they don't trust his capacity for leadership or his capacity for decision-making any more than Moraine does, and why would they? And since he set the stage for contention, they're like, okay, we'll set Avienda on him. And Avienda's unfortunate collateral duty of being the Karakarn's cultural tutor is a very believable way to impart a lot of information about Aiel ways to Rand over a relatively short amount of time. It provides a lot of comic relief, and it's an important bridge to build relationships, or at least the potential for them, because having other Aiel watch someone interact with Rand on a daily basis normalizes it. And so while all the other Aiel who travel from Roydian to Cold Rock's Hold in the Shadow Rising, at least those who weren't in the stone and didn't have Rand's Taviran influence softening their hearts, might be struggling with the idea of he who comes with the dawn being a wetlander, Seeing him establish a relationship with other Aiel no doubt helps them get their heads around it. Rand immediately clocks Avienda for a spy, and she's really bad at it, because she's a maiden and she still has a maiden's idea of honor. She's nowhere close to the wise one's pragmatism of thinking that the pattern is above the philosophy that Aiel live their lives by. For a warrior, spying is dishonorable. But for the wise ones, they're more flexible about it. They're just kind of like, we need information. And so we're going to set Avienda to gather anything that he might give us as she listens to him. And also, you know, maybe, maybe he can learn a bit about our culture and maybe not offend people nearly as much as he already offended the shit out of us in the couple of hours that we've spent in his presence. When Rand and the Aiel get to Cold Rock's hold in Book 4, he's invited beneath Leon's roof, and during the meal, Avienda is being a dick. She's giving him etiquette instructions, but laced with a whole bunch of shitty digs, and Rand is finally like, okay, I'll buy her a present as a bribe so she'll stop being such a dick to me. And when he comes back with the ivory bracelet, she's beating carpets. The wise ones were like, you're being a dick at dinner, grow up, go have some labor to punish you for acting like an asshole and a child. And it must have caused some manner of reflection on her part, because when Rand gives her the bracelet, Avienda apologizes to him for ruining the meal. And when he comes back inside, he asks the wise ones if they made her apologize, and they're like, how can you force somebody to apologize? That's fucking stupid. And Rand says to them, you must know that I know about her, that you set her to spy on me. You do not know as much as you think, Ami said, for all the world like an Aes Sedai with hidden meanings she did not intend to let him see. Malayne shifted her shawl, eyeing him up and down in a considering manner. He knew a little about Aes Sedai. If she were Aes Sedai, she would be green, Aja. I admit, she said, that at first we thought you would not see beyond a pretty young woman, and you were handsome enough that she should have found your company more amusing than ours. We did not reckon with her tongue, or other things. Then why are you so eager for her to stay with me? There was more heat in his voice than he wanted. You can't think I will reveal anything to her now that I don't want you to know. Why do you allow her to remain? Amis asked calmly. If you refuse to accept her, how could we force her on you? At least this way I know who the spy is. Having Avienda under his eye had to be better than wondering which of the Aiel were watching him. Without her, he would probably suspect that every casual comment from Rourke was an attempt to pry. Of course, there was no way to say it was not. Rourke was married to one of these women. Suddenly, he was glad he had not confided more in the clan chief, and sad that he had thought of it. Why had he ever believed the Aiel would be simpler than Terran High Lords? I'm satisfied to leave her right where she is. Then we are all satisfied, Bear said. He eyed the leathery-faced woman leerily. There had been a note of something in her voice, as if she knew more than he did. She will not find out what you want. What we want? Melaine snapped. Her long hair swung as she tossed her head. 
The prophecy says a remnant of a remnant shall be saved. What we want, Randall Thor, Kara Karn, is to save as many of our people as we can. Whatever your blood and your face, you have no feeling for us. I will make you know our blood for yours if I have to lay the- I think, Amis cut her off smoothly, that he would like to see his sleeping room now. He looks tired. So I don't know if Mulane is genuinely considering laying a bridal wreath for herself at Rant's feet or making one and dragging Avienda to lay it, but we see that they are quite keen for him to have an ideal wife. There's very little that traditionally ties people together more than marriages, especially with nobility, but we also see among the Aiel that they do marriages to solidify ties between septs and sometimes clans. So Mulane lets that slip, but Rand is just not picking it up. He's trying to think of what things do you lay? Hens lay eggs, which I think is just cute as hell. But when the wise ones are first telling Avienda, you need to stick to Rand like the hair on his head. And she's like, I will not, because she's just been through the apprentice rings and seen herself with Rand in the sex igloo. They're telling her, we're not saying you need to love him or take him to your bed. You're going to listen to him. But once you get to chapter five of the fires of heaven and they're like, hey, Egwene, what would Rand say if Avienda asked to sleep in his room? They don't ever give a real reason for why they want her to do that. And when she's like, I'd ask you not to ask this of me, because she's gone from flat out reflexively refusing to trying to finesse the situation, understanding that she's an apprentice and because they're bullies, they're going to basically have their way, they insist. They're like, we're not asking her to share his blankets. Is he going to think that? But they don't give a reason. Why does she need to be in his sleeping chamber if they're sleeping? What's the point? Is it if we put them close enough together, eventually something will happen? Which... Yeah, something does happen. And Avienda is not down for this. Partly because, yeah, she's starting to develop feelings for Rand. And when she is asking them not to make her do it, she's like, My honor, Avienda said hoarsely, then swallowed, unable to go on. She crouched there, huddling around the gourd as if it contained the honor she wanted to protect. The pattern does not see Jito, Bear told her, with only a hint of sympathy, if that. Only what must and will be. Men and maidens struggle against fate, even when it is clear the pattern weaves on despite their struggles. But you are no longer far to rise, my. You must learn to ride fate. Only by surrendering to the pattern can you begin to have some control over the course of your own life. If you fight, the pattern will still force you, and you will find only misery where you might have found contentment instead. Except that it's not the pattern forcing her into Rand's tent, it's them. And I don't know if they see it in the dream, maybe. It's never said. But that makes sense, that they have dreams that show Avienda with Rand, and maybe they're sort of like, okay, the sooner that we get this relationship going, the better, because Rand is still very distant. He has a sense of detachment toward the Aiel, so the sooner we get him an Aiel wife, the better. And since the dream is telling us that eventually he and Avienda are going to get down, let's hurry this along. And they're not telling her, hey, you need to bone the Karakarn, do it for the people, because Aiel would not do that. They're figuring, okay, because of what we've seen in the dream, once she's in there, it's going to happen, because they have seen the inevitability of fate, just as she saw it going through the rings. That's my best guess as to why they tell her to ask Rand to sleep in his room, is that they want to expedite a relationship that they have seen in the dream. I could be wrong and they're just being dicks or they feel like she should try to instruct him before bed or I don't fucking know. But the point is, Bear is telling Avienda, you have to rise above our culture because that's how you build bridges and that's how you make progress and that's how you keep people from dying out. The only way to survive is to progress. You have to go with it. So while the wise ones are concerned with practicalities and the logistics behind the fate of the people, and making sure that things are done that will help them survive, and the most people possible to survive, the clan chiefs have to help Rand lead and plan and execute. And they have to work as ambassadors to the al to Siswai, truthfully to all of the Aiel, to the merchants and the blacksmiths and everybody, so that all of them can be in a place where they can accept Rand. It's another way of navigating and keeping the ideal together, but instead of basically being like, you know, fuck Jato, we live in reality, they're like, yeah, people aren't realistic necessarily, and you've got to worry about Jato, so they deal with the other side of that coin. Rand is a wetlander. He's the destroyer. He is their doom as well as their salvation, and so the cooperation of the clan chiefs is essential. And Rand ends the Shadow Rising with five of the twelve clans in his corner. 
The Tardad are firmly there. They've been with him from the beginning. A lot of them were in the Stone of Tear and presumably have Taviran enhanced loyalty, and Rourke has been there and been an advisor, and obviously someone whose opinion Rand respects from the beginning. Then there's the Goshen, the Sharad, the Chirin, and the Tomanel. These clans are much less certain about Rand, but they were at al Dal, so they were witnesses with their own eyes to Kuladin's fuckery, and to the fact that Kuladin could not give the truth about what happens in Roydian, whereas Rand revealed the actual truth to show that he had been through the glass columns. The other six clans who weren't there will hear the story, but they're going to hear it second, third, fourth hand, and that gives room for stories to grow and change in the telling, and that makes it so that the other clans feel much less certain about joining and following this wetlander, because with disinformation, they don't know what's true. Their wise ones are getting talked to by the dreamwalkers in their dreams, but all that means is that they're being broadcast information. It doesn't make them less suspicious of this wetlander. And so Rand doesn't start out book five with nearly as strong a position as he was hoping to. At the end of book four, when Rand returns from Roydian, having captured Asmodian, he comes out of his little gateway after skimming back, and he's like, hey, what happened? And it says, The Shido have gone, behind Savannah and Kuladin, Rourke said. All who remain acknowledge you as Karakarn. The Shido were not the only ones who fled. Han's leathery face twisted sourly. Some of my Tomanel went as well, and Goshian and Sharad and Charin. Jaren and Aram nodded almost as dourly as Han. Not with the Shido, Tal Bale rumbled, but they went. They will spread what happened here, what you revealed. That was ill done. I saw men throw away their spears and run. He will bind you together and destroy you. No Tardad left, Rourke put in, not pridefully, but as a simple statement of fact. We are ready to go where you lead. And where Rand leads is back to Roydian, where there's a month or so between books, and then the body of the fires of heaven begins, after the prologue and prologue part two slash chapter one. And it starts out with Rand in a meeting with these five clan chiefs, and then Bruin of the Nakai, whose clan had the farthest to travel to get to al Dal, and was therefore the reason Rand was going to wait for a month at Cold Rock's Hold. The Nakai and the Tardad are pretty tight clans, and Rourke was positive that they would come, and it seems like Rourke's word is all it takes for Bruin to accept that Rand is he who comes with the dawn, so that's nice. Anyway, we start out in a meeting, and it says, Baal, the tallest man Rand had ever seen, and Jaren, blade slender and whip quick, lay as far from one another as they could manage and still be on the carpet. There was blood feud between Bales, Goshian, and Jaren Sherrod, suppressed for he who comes with the dawn but not forgotten, and perhaps the peace of Roydian still held despite all that had happened. Still, the tranquil sounds of the heart made a sharp contrast with the hard refusal of Bael and Jaren to look at one another. Six sets of eyes, blue or green or gray, and sun-dark faces. Aiel could make hawks look tame. What must I do to bring the rain to me, he said. You were sure they would come, Rourke. The chief of the Tardad looked at him calmly. His face could have been carved stone for all its expression. Wait, only that. Derek will bring them, eventually. White-haired Han, lying next to Rourke, twisted his mouth as if about to spit. His leathery face wore a sour look as usual. Derek has seen too many men and maidens sit staring for days, then throw down their spears, throw them down, and run away, Bale added quietly. I have seen them myself, among the Goshian, even from my own sept, running, and you, Han, among the Tomanel. We all have. I do not think they know where they are running to, only what they are running from. Cowardly snakes, Jaren barked. Gray streaked his light brown hair. There were no young men among Aiel clan chiefs, stink adders wriggling away from their own shadows. A slight shift of his blue eyes toward the far side of the carpet made it clear he meant it for a description of the Goshian, not just those who had thrown down their spears. Bael made as if to rise, his face hardening further if that was possible, but the man next to him put a quieting hand on his arm. Bruin of the Nakai was big enough and strong enough for two blacksmiths, but he had a placid nature that seemed odd for an Aiel. All of us have seen men and maidens run. He sounded almost lazy, and his gray eyes looked so, yet Rand knew otherwise. Even Rourke considered Bruin a deadly fighter and a devious tactician. Luckily, not even Rourke was stronger for Rand than Bruin, but he had come to follow he who comes with the dawn. He did not know Rand Althor. As you have, Jaren. You know how hard it was to face what they face. If you cannot name coward those who died because they could not face it, can you name coward those who run for the same reason? They should never have learned, Han muttered. 
kneading his red-tasseled blue cushion like an enemy's throat. It was for those who could enter Roydian and live. He spoke the words to no one in particular, but they had to be for Rand's ears. And a bit further, it says, It had to be told, Rand said. They had a right to know. A man shouldn't have to live a lie. Their own prophecy said I would break them, and I couldn't have done differently. The past was past and done. He should be worrying about the future. Some of these men dislike me, and some hate me for not being born among them, but they follow. I need them all. What of the Miyagoma? Aram, lying between Rourke and Hand, shook his head. His once bright red hair was half white, but his green eyes were as strong as any younger man's. His big hands, wide and long and hard, said his arms were as strong, too. Timelin does not let his feet know which way he will jump until after he's leaped. When Timelin was young as a chief, Jaron said, he tried to unite the clans and failed. It will not sit well with him that at last one has come to succeed where he failed. He will come, Rourke said. Timelin never believed himself, he who comes with the dawn. And Janwin will bring the Shianda, but they will wait. They must settle matters in their own minds first. They must settle he who comes with the dawn being a wetlander, Han barked. I mean no offense, Karakarn. There was no obsequiousness in his voice. A chief was not a king, and neither was the chief of chiefs. At best he was first among equals. The Dorain and the Kadara will come eventually as well, I think, Bruin said calmly, and quickly, lest silence should grow to a reason for dancing the spears. First among equals at best. They have lost more than any other clan to the bleakness. That was what the Aiel had taken to calling the long period of staring before someone tried to run away from being Aiel. For the moment, Mandalayne and Endyrion are concerned with holding their clans together, and both will want to see the dragons on your arms for themselves, but they will come. So the chiefs and Rand go on to talk about the Shido, and how Kuladin is refusing to talk and flaying any messengers that are sent, but more or less entrenched and not willing to come attack them, and Bael and Jaren, who have their blood feud, both refer to the Shido as honorless dogs at the same time, and it says... Honorless or not, Bruin said quietly, Kuladin's numbers are growing. Calm as he sounded, he still took a deep drink from his goblet before going on. You all know what I am speaking of. Some of those who run after the bleakness do not throw away their spears. Instead, they join with their societies among the Shido. No Tomanel has ever broken clan, Han barked. Bruin looked past Rourke and Aram at the Tomanel chief and said deliberately, It has happened in every clan. Without waiting for another challenge to his word, he settled back on his cushion. It cannot be called breaking clan. They join their societies, like the Shido maidens who have come to their roof here. Except that it's not like that, because the Shido societies won't accept the men that come, and so they all have to group together as the brotherless, which is kind of fucked. But Han's offense at the notion of breaking clan gives an idea of how the Shido feel about the Meridin, and why they won't accept them. The Shido value clan above all, and can't fathom abandoning your clan for something like principles. So they abandon their principles for their clan. And while some are true believers, and really think Kuladin is the Kar Karn, plenty of them, and perhaps most of them probably, are going along to get along. Because Aiel, who think the election was rigged to go to join their societies among the Shido, Rand is kind of like, well, would it be dishonorable if we sent warriors crying fake news to infiltrate, I mean, join their societies? And it is not taken well. They're openly disgusted and tell him nobody of honor would spy like that. And the difference between the clan chiefs and the wise ones is that the wise ones would tell him, you're not going to find anybody whose honor would let them do that. A subtle distinction, but one that shows the wise ones can see the practicality of it. They would find it distasteful, but totally see the point of doing it. None of these clan chiefs, except maybe Rourke, are Rand's friends. None of them are really interested in getting to know him. Even Bruin is like, he's here and he's strong for he who comes with the dawn. He doesn't give a shit about Rand Althor. Rourke has had time to get to know Rand, and he probably has sons Rand's age. We know he has daughters Rand's age, because Egwene is perturbed and disappointed to learn he sees her like them. She visits one of Rourke's dreams during her lessons and gets caught in it, and he gives her a doll for being a good kid, and she ends up being a child in his dream. So there is a good chance with two wives that he also has sons, and Rand has got to be about the same age as one of those sons, one would think. And he wants Rand to succeed, for the good of the people, but also for Rand's own sake. I think he knows that Rand is a young man of much honor, and that while he is an ignorant wetlander, that doesn't mean that he doesn't want to do well or to know better. And so Rourke tries to help Rand when he makes mistakes or faux pas, and he tries to help Rand unfuck it. 
So in the Shadow Rising, as they're traveling to Cold Rock's hold, it's like the first day, Avienda is spying on him. She's being insufferable. And she keeps talking to him about Elaine. And she's driving him nuts. So he's finally like, what can I do to get her to fuck off? And he thinks, oh, swords. I yield hate swords. I'll get Lon to practice with me. And so he's in the desert heat practicing the sword with Lon. And he ends up getting an Aiel audience watching him. And Rourke is just kind of like, fuck, okay. So he comes with some water for Rand to drink, and he dresses down Avienda, telling her everybody gets a pass when they're super disappointed about something, but you don't get to act like an asshole forever, so, you know, grow up. Yeah, you're sad, you're upset that you had to stop being a maiden of the spear, get over yourself. And yeah, it really sucks, her having to give that up. It's like working hard to get into special forces or something, and after a couple of years getting put on a desk job, you're still a soldier, but not the kind you wanted to be, and it's heartbreaking because you're losing much of your identity. But you don't get to take out your frustration on others and not get called out for it. So Rourke hits Abby with a sick burn, and then it says, Rourke tossed him the sloshing water skin. The lukewarm water slid down his throat like chilled wine. He tried not to splash any over his face, not to waste it, but it was hard. I thought you might like to learn the spear, Rourke said when Rand finally lowered the half-empty skin. For the first time, Rand realized the clan chief was carrying only two spears and a pair of bucklers. Not practice spears, if there were any such. A foot of sharp steel tipped each. Steel or wood, his muscles cried out for rest. His legs wanted him to sit down, and his head wanted to lie down. Keely and the Glee Man were gone, but Aiel were still watching him from both camps. They had seen him practicing with a despised sword, if a wooden one. They were his people. He did not know them, but they were his, in more senses than one. Avienda was still watching him, too, glowering as though blaming him for Rourke having set her down. Not that she had anything to do with his decision, of course. The Jindo and Shida were watching. That was it. That mountain can grow awfully heavy sometimes, he sighed, taking a spear and buckler from Rourke. When do you find a chance to put it down a while? When you die, Lon said simply. Forcing his legs to move and trying to ignore Avienda, Rand squared off with Rourke. He did not mean to die just yet. No, not for a long time yet. And so from then on, Rand incorporates spears as part of his daily routine to assure the Aiel, I'm not just going to show the sword and be offensive to you. I'm going to demonstrate that I care about your ways of fighting too as a matter of showing respect. And he also starts to learn what I've always pictured as Krav Maga, though RJ may have been thinking of a different form of martial arts. He just says the way of fighting with hands and feet. The Warrior Society knife hands makes it sound like he was picturing karate, but realistically the Aiel would use something that had grappling as well as striking, so I'm just going to call it Krav Maga. Anyway, he incorporates that along with his spears and his sword into his daily workout routine, and so the Aiel are able to see that this wetlander is not one of us, but he's showing respect for our ways. That said, Rand resists Aiel identity. And even when he accepts that they're the people of the dragon and he comes from their blood, he's never willing to fake it. While traveling through the waste in Book 4, he uses the Shufa to protect his head from the sun. But it says, He had resisted donning any more I yield garb, no matter how much more suited to the climate than his red wool coat. Whatever his blood, whatever the marks on his forearms, he was not I yield and he would not pretend. Whatever he had to do, he could hang on to that scrap of decency. So Rand feels like doing anything other than being himself is equivalent to tricking these people. He's not trying to be a charlatan. He has to come as he is and earn their loyalty that way. And so he further refuses Rourke's suggestion when they are heading to Alcair Dahl to put on Cat and Sore. He's like, I can't show them a pretend I yield. They have to know I'm a wetlander and they have to accept it. They will see me as I am. Because the Aiel are not the only people that Rand is obligated to. Rand himself is a bridge between peoples. So his face and the dragons on his arms are for him enough to show his Aiel lineage. He has no other pretensions to it, and he shouldn't have to. And perhaps part of his very blatant and in-your-face stubborn wetlanderness is the fact that the Aiel have such a lack of empathy for wetlanders. He struggles with that. Wetlanders lack empathy for Aiel as well, and they're racist toward them, and they call them savages, but frankly, wetlanders have a lot more right to be upset and rude about the Aiel than the other way around. Wetlanders were minding their own business when the Aiel got a bug up their ass because Layman cut down a tree and they decided to come over the dragon wall. And I'm sorry, but once you give someone a gift, that gift is theirs to do with as they like. 
Were the Aiel within their rights to be offended by the cutting down of a vendor ladera? Absolutely. Was taking away the right to use the Silk Path a proportionate response to such an insult? Yeah. But invading Kai Rien and executing Layman was the equivalent of a temper tantrum, and it's not a good look especially because they weren't particularly stated in their intention, so most wetlanders view Aiel as an unpredictable and savage horde who attacked with no reason. And as for their actual reason, it's as flimsy as Americans who think it's okay to invade countries just because they burn our flag. So I kind of feel like wetlander prejudice against Aiel is far more rooted in a realistic cause than Aiel prejudice against wetlanders. Rand especially has a hard time with the way that the Aiel dehumanized the Kyrianin. Kuladin and the Shido leave in the middle of the night, heading for the Jangai Pass, and Rand and all of his Aiel follow behind. And when they get to the Jangai Pass, there's a small little town on the hillside, which has to be a really shitty place to grow up, not gonna lie. And Rand rides up and he's approached by the survivors, the leftovers of all of the people that got captured and taken Gaishain or murdered and left there hanging over the walls. There's just these few remnants to leave a message for Rand because Kuladin is a fucking asshole. And so these poor terrorized people get terrorized further when Rand's Aiel, finished with their scouting, pop up like the world's most traumatic jump scare, sending the people fleeing for the hills. And Rand's upset about it and lashes out at Rourke and Derek, who has finally brought the Rain Clan. It says, Was that necessary? He said as the two chiefs came up to him. He had frightened the people first, but for cause, and had not made them think they were going to die. Rourke simply shrugged, and Derek said, We put spears in place around this hold unseen as you wished, and there seemed no reason to wait since no one remained here to dance spears. Besides, they are only tree killers. Rand drew a deep breath. He had known this might be as large a problem as Kuladin in its own way. And a little bit further it says, Their contempt for the tree killers, the oath breakers, had never died. Moraine being Aes Sedai offset her being Kyrianin, but Rand was never sure how much. These folk broke no oaths, he told them. Find the others. The saddle maker says there were about a hundred, and be gentle with them. If any of them were watching, they're probably running away into the mountains by now. The two Aiel started to turn away, and he added, did you hear what they told me? What do you think of what Kuladin did here? They killed more than they had to, Derek said with a disgusted shake of his head, like black ferrets falling on a rock hen's nest in a gully. Killing was as easy as dying, so the Aiel said. Any fool could do either. And the other thing? Taking prisoners. Guy Shine. Rourke and Derek exchanged looks, and Derek's mouth tightened. Clearly they had heard, and it made them uncomfortable. It took a great deal to make an Aiel uncomfortable. It cannot be so, Rourke said at last. If it is, Gaishine is a thing of Jiato. No one can be made Gaishine who does not follow Jiato, else they are only human animals, such as the Sharans keep. Kuladin has abandoned Jiato. Derek sounded as though he were saying stones had grown wings. Rand thinks the Aiel hatred of all Kyrian and because of Layman's sin is ridiculous, which it is. And Rand is willing to be hard with these people who do not follow him out of fear. So they get through the Jangai Pass, and Rand starts laying out some laws, because he's like, okay, these four clans who haven't come to me yet are following behind us, so here's the rules that they need to know. And it says, A hard message, Baal said. For us as well, if you mean we cannot take the fifth. Han and the rest, even Rourke, nodded. The fifth I give you. Rand did not raise his voice. Yet suddenly his words were driven nails, but no part of that is to be food. We will live on what can be found wild or hunted or bought, if there is anyone with food to sell, until I can have the Terrans increase what they're bringing up from Tyr. If any man takes a penny more than the fifth or a loaf of bread without payment, if he burns so much as a hut because it belongs to a tree killer or kills a man who is not trying to kill him, that man will I hang, whoever he is." Dark to tell the clans this, Derek said, almost as stony. I came to follow he who comes with the dawn, not to coddle oathbreakers. Baal and Jaren opened their mouths as if to agree, but each saw the other and snapped his teeth shut again. Mark what I said, Derek, Rand said. I came to save this land, not ruin it further. What I say stands for every clan, including the Miagoma and any more who follow. Every clan. You mark me well. This time no one spoke, and he swung back into Jaden's saddle, letting the stallion walk on among the chiefs. Those Aiel faces showed no expression. So, Rand has zero patience for Aiel lack of empathy. 
lack of imagination toward wetlanders, lack of imagination toward him and his position, and the fact that he actually needs these other nations to be cooperative with him, when they're all like, yeah, we can just go in and pull over everything and stab the wetlands into submission, and Rand's like, fucking no, I have to have cooperation with these people, even though it's going to be like wrestling a snake to get them to be cooperative. And so he is willing to roll out the hard ass to a certain extent, because he cannot identify with their unwillingness to feel pity for the refugees, the people who were left behind in the places that Kuladin destroyed. And I wonder if in this, RJ is exploring a little bit how he noticed people when he was in Vietnam, fellow soldiers perhaps, dehumanized the Southeast Asian population in order to be able to have a certain amount of detachment, or just because they were racist, or because some of the Vietnamese were their enemies, they lumped them all together and were terrible to everyone. That sense of detachment is a useful thing to help you not feel bad when bad things happen to people, or to allow you to feel okay doing bad things to people in a warlike setting, and it's a pretty common thing. And I'm wondering if that's kind of what he shows here, is some of what he saw. There's just this utter indifference to wetlanders and their pain and their lives because Aiel are cold and detached about it, whereas wetlanders toward Aiel have this sense of anger and hatred and almost desire for vengeance because they're pissed that the Aiel came over the dragon wall for no good fucking reason and killed a whole bunch of them. And fair. But the clan chiefs work with him in order to get the people to follow, even as the bleakness chips away and they feel very resistant to the idea of this wetlander telling them what to do. And not just that he tells them what to do, but that he has the presumption to decide the best way to handle their culture despite having really no understanding of Jiito. And I have to think that his relationships and his interactions with all of these other Aigil would be so much more fraught. If along with being the Aiel's doom, and being a destroyer, and being a wetlander, Rand were not also a son of a maiden. All of the Aiel warrior societies undoubtedly have individual cultures, but the maiden's culture is so rich that it actually has a language with their hand talk, as opposed to just some signs specifically for tactical purposes. Men have 11 societies to choose from, meaning a man chooses his society based upon the type of work that he's inclined to do. And each warrior society does different types of shit, just like different military specialties do different types of things. They say that stone dogs work as rear guards, and they will fall to a man to let everybody else retreat. And that's kind of their whole philosophy, to very casually say, yeah, we'll stay back here and die so you guys can get away, which is super edgelord and also speaks to a dark practicality of someone who is grateful for honor and knows we all got awake from the dream sooner or later. Red shields, presumably like order or rules, and while much of being Aiel, who do have a fairly complicated system of laws, involves being policed by your own honor, I'm guessing when law enforcement outside of the auspices of Jiito is required, it takes a certain delicacy so as not to dishonor others further, so I wonder if red shields are almost as much social workers as cops. Water seekers are extreme survivalists. Black eyes do night ops and maidens are used a lot for intelligence and reconnaissance work. But what makes a maiden is just that you're a woman. And so presumably the maidens of the spear are a larger warrior society than any of the others. But who can say how much? You never know what the ratio is as far as male warriors to female warriors among the Aiel. I assume that men are warriors by default as you start out, and you either opt out for some reason possibly because you have some manner of injury that prevents you from being a warrior, or because you're just not athletic or coordinated enough to be a good one, or you have some other kind of talent like being a blacksmith, but women have to opt in. So maybe 10 to 25% of warriors are maidens. That's just my best guess. Rand sees girls in Cold Rock's hold running around playing, and he says that half of them are carrying toy spears, which would make it seem like, oh, 50% of the warriors are women, but there seem to be more career paths or paths to honor for women. And I yield gender roles don't allow for soldiers to be mothers, and shit happens. So women who decide earlier on that, yeah, I'd love to be far to rice my, but honestly, I want a baby, or oops, I got pregnant, here's a baby and I'm keeping it, or yeah, I want to make a bridal wreath for this guy. Lots of women end up doing other things, even though they ran around and played with spears when they were kids. Every culture in the Wheel of Time handles gender differently. A Shan Chen woman can be both a soldier and a mother, provided that they have the social standing that they can have a nanny anyway. Egyanan's mother was a ship captain. 
Her father was a soldier, and her mother was like a ship captain, like the Empress's special ship captain. So obviously Agianan was raised by nannies and shit. But nobody told her mom, oh, you can't be a naval officer because you have a kid. And while it's tempting to be frustrated with the Aiel insistence that women who want to be mothers give up the spear, different cultures do different things for different reasons, and maybe among Aiel culture because it's seen as quite probable that a child will lose one parent by the time they reach adulthood, if a woman wants to keep her child, then she needs to take on a safer occupation because the chance that they will lose their father is pretty likely, considering the chances that a father is a warrior is also highly likely. Who knows? What we know is that a maiden can bone down as much as she likes with dudes, but if she gets preggers and she wants to hold on to the spear, bye-bye baby. Which is an easy choice to make for some people, but a brutal one for others. And it's a pain that many a maiden has endured, where she values her career more than keeping a baby, but she really wanted the baby. Knowing that he who comes with the dawn would be the son of a maiden means that stories have to be passed down, and the tale of He Who Comes with the Dawn has to be part of the fabric of the culture of the warrior society. So the maidens of the spear have the foundation to both accept Rand and to claim him. And this foundation is built upon the trauma of lost children, or children that have been given up or traded in a horrible bargain. Because it's a horrible bargain for people who don't want to give up their babies, but have to pay that price to keep their job, when really, they'd love to be able to go run raids and be like, hey, it takes a village, I'm going to leave the baby at home, go run some raids and come back. Or have the option to, once the child hits a certain age, go back to work stabbing people, or whatever. The point being that they have a ready-made base upon which to welcome Rand into their fold. And who knows whether they would have embraced him regardless, but his clueless fumbling in his dealing with Avienda absolutely clinches it. Avienda is in a position that no maiden could ever wish for. Women who get pregnant may agonize about the choice that they have to make, where they're like, I really want to keep being far to rice my, that's my identity but I'm also feeling some kind of way about this baby. I kind of want to keep this baby, but I want to be a maiden more. And so they have this choice, even if it's a super painful one. But Avienda did not choose to give up the spear. She was forced to due to cultural obligations that none of her non-channeling spear sisters have to worry about. And they feel bad for her. You know, they avoid looking at her when she first has to put on her skirts and her blouse, and they are so grateful not to be in her shoes. Even a woman who chose to give up the spear and make a bridal wreath and keep a child because it's the less painful of her options is making a choice. Avienda's choice is stolen from her, and her spear sisters grieve with her, even as they're kind of avoiding it and leaving her to herself. So in book four, they travel to Cold Rock's hold, and Rand gets invited beneath Leon's roof, and they have the horrible dinner where Avienda acts like a dick, and Rand leaves. He goes outside, partly because Moraine pisses him off, and it says, The roof of the maidens lay halfway up the still brightly lit east wall of the canyon, a garden-topped rectangle of grayish stone, doubtless larger inside than it looked. Not that he saw the inside. A pair of maidens squatting beside the door with spears and bucklers refused him entrance, amused and scandalized that a man wanted to enter, but one agreed to carry his request in. A few minutes later, the Jindo and Nine Valley's maidens who had gone to the stone came out, and all the other maidens of Nine Valley's sept and cold rocks too, crowding the path to either side and climbing up on the roof among the rows of vegetables to watch, grinning as if they expected entertainment. Gaishain, male as well as female, followed to serve them small cups of dark-brewed tea. Whatever rule kept men outside the roof of the maidens apparently did not apply to Guy Shane. After he had examined several offerings, Adeline, the yellow-haired Jindo woman with a thin scar on her cheek, produced a wide bracelet of ivory heavily carved with roses. He thought it should suit Avienda. Whoever made it had carefully shown thorns among the blossoms. Adeline was tall even for an Aiel woman, only a hand too short to look him in the eyes. When she heard why he wanted it, Almost why, he just said it was a present for Avienda's teachings, not a sop to soothe the woman's temper so he could stand to be near her. Adeline looked around at the other maidens. They had all stopped grinning, their faces expressionless. I will take no price for this, Randall Thor, she said, putting the bracelet in his hand. Is this wrong? he asked. How would I yield see it? I don't want to dishonor Avienda in any way. It will not dishonor her. She beckoned a Guy Shane woman carrying pottery cups and pitcher on a silver tray, Pouring two cups, she handed one to him. Remember honor, she said, sipping from his cup. 
Avienda had never mentioned anything like this. Uncertain, he took a sip of bitter tea and repeated, Remember honor. It seemed the safest thing to say. To his surprise, she kissed him lightly on each cheek. An older maiden, gray-haired but still hard-faced, appeared in front of him. Remember honor, she said and sipped. He had to repeat the ritual with every maiden there, finally just touching the cup to his lips. Ideal ceremonies might be short and to the point, but when you had to repeat one with seventy-odd women, even sips could fill you up. Shadows were climbing the east side of the canyon by the time he escaped. He found Avienda near Leon's house, vigorously beating a blue-striped carpet hung on a line, more piled beside her in a heap of colors. Brushing sweat-damp strands of hair from her forehead, she stared at him expressionlessly when he handed her the bracelet and told her it was a gift in return for her teaching. I have given bracelets and necklaces to friends who did not carry the spear, Randall Thor, but I have never worn one. Her voice was perfectly flat. Such things rattle and make noise to give you away when you must be silent. They catch when you must move quickly. But you can wear it now that you are going to be a wise one. Yes. She turned the ivory circle over as if unsure what to do with it, then abruptly thrust her hand through it and held her wrist up to stare at it. She could have been looking at a manacle. If you do not like it. Avienda Adeline said it would not touch your honor. She even seemed to approve. He mentioned the tea-sipping ceremony, and she squeezed her eyes shut and shuddered. What is wrong? They think you are trying to attract my interest. He could not have believed her voice could be so flat. Her eyes held no emotion at all. They have approved of you as if I still carried the spear. Light! Simple enough to set them straight. I don't... He cut off as her eyes blazed up. No, you accepted their approval and now you would reject it? That would dishonor me. Do you think you were the first man to try to catch my eye? They must think as they think now. It means nothing. Grimacing, she gripped the woven perfect beater with both hands. Go away. With a glance at the bracelet, she added, You truly know nothing, do you? You know nothing. It is not your fault. So this blows up and has great unintended consequences. He's thinking of this gift as a bribe and resents it, only to learn that it hasn't worked that way at all. She's still acting like an asshole, and now the maidens are shipping them. Then there's the attack with the Trollocs and Drakkar that Asmodian sets up. It's a whole distraction, presumably partly to hide the fact that the Shido were taking off, but after that attack we're getting the breakdown through Matt's perspective. And Rourke says, Since the Drakkar failed, I fear we can expect the soulless next, what you call Grey Men. I want to put spears around you at all times. For some reason the maidens have volunteered for this task. The cold was getting to Avienda. Shoulders hunched, she had her hands shoved into her armpits as far as they would go. If they wish it, Rant said. He sounded a touch uncomfortable under all that ice. Matt did not blame him. He would not have put himself in the maiden's hands again for all the silk on sea folk ships. They will watch better than anyone else, Rourke said, having asked for the task. I do not mean to leave it to them alone, however. I will have everyone on guard. I believe it will be the soulless next, but that does not mean it cannot be something else. Ten thousand Trollocs instead of a few hundred. So that begins it as their way to give more approval to their former spear sister and this son of a maiden. They're like, yeah, we ship it. And then RJ shows us this cute bit in a flashback as Rand and the maidens and Rourke and everybody are headed into Al Doll. It says, You have no society, Adeline had told him when he suggested some other than the maidens of the spear might provide his escort. Each chief, whether of clan or sept, would be accompanied by men from the society he had belonged to before becoming chief. You have no society, but your mother was a maiden. The yellow-haired woman and the other nine had not looked at Avienda a few steps away in the entry hall to Leon's roof. They had not looked intently. For countless years, maidens who would not give up the spear have given their babes for the wise ones to hand to other women, none knowing where the child went or even whether boy or girl. Now a maiden's son has come back to us and we know him. We will go to al Dal for your honor, son of Shayil, a maiden of the Chumai Tardad. Her face was so set, all of their faces were, including Avi Enda's, that he thought they might offer to dance the spears if he refused. When he accepted, they made him go through that ritual of remember honor again, this time with some drink called Usquai, made from Zamai, drinking to the bottom of a small silver cup with each of them. Ten maidens, ten little cups. The stuff looked like faintly brown-tinged water, tasted almost like it, and was stronger than double-distilled brandy. He had not been able to walk straight after, and they had got him to bed, laughing at him, no matter how he protested, as much as he could with all of them tickling him so he could barely breathe for laughing himself. All but Avienda. Not that she went away. She stayed and watched the whole thing with a face as blank as stone. When Adeline and the others finally tucked him into his blankets and left, Avienda sat down beside the door, spreading her dark, heavy skirts, watching him stonily until he fell asleep. 
At his waking, she was still there, still watching, and refusing to talk about maidens or usquai or any of it. As far as she was concerned, it seemed not to have happened. Whether the maidens would have been as reticent, he did not know. How could you possibly look ten women in the face and ask why they had gotten you drunk and made a game of taking your clothes off and putting you to bed? And I just fucking love that. And Rand probably suggested another society because Avienda is perturbed, and he already knows that they're shipping them. But we get this first small glimpse in Book 4 of the dynamic that will exist between Rand and the Maidens. And I particularly love the whole bit about them getting him shit-faced and carrying him to bed and tickling him a whole bunch. Because it's like they're playing with him like he's a brother. And it's this cute and human moment of him having this intimate, almost familial interaction with the Maidens. And being brought in and accepted. And getting that right before the Book 4 climax is just really great. And then, in the fires of heaven, RJ explores it and goes deeper. He shows the rabbit hole that poor Rand feels dragged down. He leaves the meeting of the chiefs and walks through Roydian with the maidens and goes to where they're all living together. It says, Except for Guy Shane, men were not allowed beneath the roof of the maidens. Not any man, not in any hold in the waist. A chief or a maiden's blood kin could die trying, though in fact no Aegealman would ever think of it. It was the same for any society. Only members and the Guy Shane were allowed inside. The two maidens standing guard at the tall bronze doors flash maiden hand talk at one another, cutting their eyes in his direction as he came through the columns, then shared a small grin. He wished he knew what they had said. Even in as dry a land as the waste, bronze would tarnish with enough time, but Guy Shane had polished these doors until they looked new made. They stood wide open, and the pair of guards made no move to hinder him as he walked through, Adeline and the others on his heels. The wide, white-tiled corridors and great rooms inside were full of maidens, sitting about on bright cushions, talking, tending to weapons, playing cat's cradle or stones or thousand flowers, an aeel game that involved laying out patterns of flat bits of stone carved with what seemed a hundred different symbols. Of course, a profusion of Guy Shane moved smoothly about their chores, cleaning, serving, mending, seeing to oil lamps that ranged from simple glazed pottery to gilded loot from somewhere, to the tall stand lamps that had been found in the city. In most rooms, colorful carpets and bright tapestries covered the floors and walls, and nearly as many patterns and styles as there were carpets and tapestries. The walls and ceilings themselves were detailed mosaics of forests and rivers and skies that had never been seen in the waste. Young or old, the maidens smiled when they saw him, and some nodded familiarly or even patted his shoulder. Others called out, asking how he was, had he eaten, would he like the guy Shane to bring him wine or water. He responded briefly, though with answering smiles. He was well and neither hungry nor thirsty. He kept walking, not even slowing when he spoke. Slowing would lead inevitably to stopping, and he was not up to that tonight. Fardarismai had adopted him after a fashion. Some treated him as a son, others as a brother. Age seemed not to come into it. Women with white in their hair might talk to him as a brother over tea, while maidens no more than a year older than he tried to make sure he wore the proper clothes for the heat. There was no avoiding the mothering. They simply did it, and he could not see how to make them stop short of using the power against the whole lot of them. He had thought of trying to have another society provide his guards. Shane Matal, the Stone Dogs, perhaps, or Ethan Dorr, the Red Shields. Rourke had been a Red Shield before becoming Chief. Only what reason could he possibly give? Not the truth, certainly. Just thinking about explaining that to Rourke and the others made him uncomfortable. Aiel humor being what it was, even sour old hand would likely break his ribs laughing. Any reason at all would probably offend the honor of every last maiden. At least they rarely mothered him except under the roof where there was no one to see but themselves and Guy Shane, who knew better than to speak of anything that happened there. The maidens, he had once said, carry my honor. Everyone remembered that, and the maidens were as proud of it as if he had given them all thrones. But it had turned out that they carried it in a manner they chose. Adeline and the other four left him to join their friends, but he was hardly alone as he climbed higher in the building, along curving flights of wide white stairs. He had to answer the same questions at practically every step. No, he was not hungry. Yes, he knew he was not used to the heat yet, and no, he had not spent too much time in the sun. He bore it all patiently, but he did heave a sigh of relief when he reached the second story above the huge window. Here there were no maidens and no guy Shane in the broad hallways or on the stairs that led on upward. The bare walls and empty chambers emphasized the absence of people, but after traversing the floors below, he found solitude a blessing. So, Rand is an honorary maiden. They want to wet him into their society because Avienda will always be one of them. And this is a beautiful bunch of relationships that I wish Rand treated with more respect. And it makes sense from a Two Rivers perspective that he wouldn't settle in among the women and play games 
Or maybe he does to a certain extent, because it says that he drinks tea with some of them, so maybe he is having more intimate moments and we're just not getting it here and seeing a more day-to-day -day kind of domestic situation with them. We're just seeing where he can't handle their shit tonight, so he wants to be by himself. Whereas maybe sometimes he would settle down among them. So I don't know if from a Two Rivers perspective he wouldn't hang out with them, or if it's just that they drive him off with the mothering because he just can't deal with it. But I'd like to see more of it, because it's really special. The Maiden's embrace of Rand is critical to the whole Aiel embrace of him. Their bringing him close shows an acceptance of change, a willingness to deal with the harsh truth that he shows. They are going with it. They're like, a son of a maiden has come home, and we carry his honor, and the rest of it is okay. We'll deal with it. We'll deal with whatever. So, in Chapter 5 of The Fires of Heaven, as we're in Egwene's point of view, she joins the Wise Ones, the Dreamwalkers, in the Sweat Tent, and they're talking about how there are Tuatha'an in the Threefold Land, and how some of the people who throw away their spears go to the Tinkers. And it says, He brings change, Melaine whispered harshly into the steam. I thought you were reconciled to the changes he brings, Egwene said, sympathy welling up in her voice. It must be very hard to have your whole life stood on end. She half expected to be told to hold her tongue again, but no one did. Reconciled, Bear said as though tasting the word. Better to say we endure them as best we can. He transforms everything. Ami sounded troubled. Roydian, the lost ones. The bleakness in telling what should not have been told. The wise ones, all the Aegeal for that matter, still a difficulty speaking of that. The maidens cluster about him as though they owe more to him than to their own clans, Bear added. The first time ever they have allowed a man beneath the roof of the maidens. For a moment, Amice looked about to say something, but whatever she knew about the inner workings of Farderice Mai, she shared with no one but those who were or had been maidens of the spear. Amice knows why Rand is precious. A child of a maiden has come home to them. The maidens who mother him bore and gave up babies because a yield culture and gender roles force women to choose, and these maidens chose their career. And while Amis couldn't have been a maiden for a really long time, because like Avienda she was forced to give up the spear because she could channel, and therefore had a duty to become a wise one, she still must have known women who made that agonizing choice, and must have comforted women who chose to give up a baby, and therefore understands in a way none of the other wise ones can why Rand is so important. And we can assume that at least some of the maidens who left the Shido to come and join the society in Roydian, because Fardarice Mai carries Rand's honor, bore babies and gave them up. Probably not all of them, but it makes sense that some of them did, possibly even the majority. But even if not, the culture and the foundation within the society is so strong, it's worth those Shido Maidens leaving their clan to be part of this connection with the son of a Maiden, because men don't come from the Shido to join their societies. The honor and the connection is unique to the Maidens alone. And this possessiveness, this ownership that they have, gets to the point where it becomes coveted by many of the men who come to terms with Rand's revelations. After the Battle of Kai Rien, when Rand nearly kills himself channeling, and he wakes up in his tent and determines that he's going to ride into Kai Rien and surprise the nobles, he goes with Avienda, and he has Asmodian and this little Kyrian and banner bearer, and he's looking at the prisoners they've taken. There's a whole bunch of Shido Gaishine, and he's thinking, I don't know if I'd ever trust any Shido Gaishine, which me either, Rand. And it says, it took some time before he noticed an oddity among the other Aegeal. Maidens and Aigeel men who carried the spear never wore anything on their heads except the shufa, and never any color that would not fade into rocks and shadows. But now he saw men with a narrow scarlet headband. Perhaps one in four or five had a strip of cloth knotted around his temples with a disc embroidered or painted above the brows, two joined teardrops black and white. Perhaps most strangely of all, Guy Shane wore it too. Most had their cowls up, but every last bareheaded one wore it, and Algaida Siswai and their cat and sore saw and did nothing whether wearing the headband or not. Gaishain were never to wear anything that those who could touch weapons did. Never. I do not know, Avienda said curtly into his back when he asked what it meant. He tried to sit up straighter. She really did seem to be holding to him more tightly than necessary. After a moment, she went on, so softly that he had to listen sharp to catch it all. Bear threatened to strike me if I mentioned it again, and Soralia hit me across the shoulders with a stick. But I think they are those who claim we are Saswayamon. Rand opened his mouth to ask the meaning. He knew a scant few words of the old tongue, no more, when interpretation floated to the surface of his mind. Sesuayamon, literally the spear of the dragon. 
Sometimes, Asmodian chuckled, it is difficult to see the difference between oneself and one's enemies. They want to own the world, but it seems you already own a people. Turning his head, Rance stared at him until amusement faded, and shrugging uncomfortably, he let his mule fall back beside Pevin and the banner. The trouble was that the name did imply, more than implied, ownership. That was out of Luce Theron's memories, too. It did not seem possible to own people, but if it was, he did not want to. All I want is to use them, he thought wryly. I see you don't believe it, he said over his shoulder. None of the maidens had donned the thing. Avian hesitated before saying, I do not know what to believe. She spoke as quietly as before, yet she sounded angry and unsure. There are many beliefs, and the wise ones are often silent as if they do not know the truth. Some say that in following you we expiate the sin of our ancestors in failing the Aes Sedai. The catch in her voice startled him. He had never considered that she might be as worried as any other Aegeel about what he had revealed of their past. Ashamed might be a better word than worried. Shame was an important part of Jiato. They were ashamed of what they had been, followers of the Way of the Leaf, and at the same time ashamed that they had abandoned their pledge to it. Too many have heard some version of the prophecy of Roydian now, she went on in a more controlled tone, for all the world as if she had heard a word of that prophecy herself before she began training to become a wise one. But it has been twisted. They know that you will destroy us. Her control faltered for the space of one deep breath. But many believe that you will kill us all in endless dances of the spear, a sacrifice to atone for the sin. Others believe that the bleakness itself is a testing to wear away all but the hard core before the last battle. I have even heard some say that the Aiel are now your dream, and that when you wake from this life we will be no more. A grim set of beliefs, that. Bad enough that he had revealed a past they saw as shaming. It was a wonder they had not all left him, or gone mad. What do the wise ones believe? he asked as quietly as she. That what must be will be. We will save what can be saved, Randall Thor. We do not hope to do more. We. She included herself among the wise ones, just as Egwene and Elaine included themselves among Aes Sedai. The Siswayamon take possession of Rand with a claim that he possesses them. It's their way to have their connection with him. And later on in Book 6, as Rand is kidnapped, and Perrin is like, Hey, I'm going to go after him. Can you give me some soldiers? And Rourke's like, I can only give you maidens and Siswayamon. Perrin, in watching the interactions and interpreting things based on smells, notices that the maidens smell possessive, and the Siswayamon smell jealous. These loyalists of Aiel are very territorial, and the maidens are like, this is our Karakarn, we have his honor. And the men, who have at this point kind of given themselves to the dragon, are wondering, why can't we have our slice? We have made accommodations. We have come to terms with these revelations. We need something here. But while winning in Kyrian brought the Siswayamon about, and I'm guessing defeating the Shido and having the final four clans join Rand after the battle quelled doubts, it doesn't make Rand very comfortable. And he repeatedly dishonors the maidens as he turns around and gives honor to the men. The cluster of chapters at the beginning of the book that take place inside Roydian ends, and Rand learns that the Shido are heading for the Jangai Pass. And like I said in my last episode, I don't know if that has to do with forsaken fuckery, whether Samael or Lanfear or Ravan did something that encouraged Kuladin and Savannah to pack everybody up and go. I don't think so. I think it was literally their choice alone, but there's no way to know. Anyway, Rand and crew follow and reach the Jangai Pass in Chapter 20 and get to the town where the Aiel are shitty about the poor leftover Kyrian and refugees. And Rand's like, okay, well, Kuladin could have left a surprise up in the pass, so we should send some scouts ahead. Let's send some water seekers. And it says, Sulin and the other maidens gave Rand flat stares as the rain chief walked away down slope. He had chosen scouts from other societies for the last three days when he had begun to fear what he might find here, and he had the feeling they knew he was not just giving the others their turns. He tried to ignore their looks. Sulin's was especially difficult. The woman could have driven nails with those pale blue eyes. Book five is the book where RJ really starts to lean into the Rand can't kill women device. I know Jordan was working through a personal trauma when it came to his own war experiences, and I have to thank Michael Livingston for quoting Jordan about it in his Watt Origins book, because otherwise who knows how many years it would have taken my lazy ass to look through the Theoryland archives and actually find the interview. So regarding Rand's particular issue... It quotes Jordan as saying, I suppose actually that particular thing came from the only time I was really shaken in combat and shooting at somebody, or shooting at somebody. 
I had to, uh, I was shooting back at some people on a sampan and a woman came out and pulled up an AK-47 and I didn't hesitate about shooting her, but that stuck with me. I was raised in a very old fashioned sort of way. You don't hurt women. You don't do that. That's the one thing that stuck with me for a long, long time. So Rand having this trait of wanting to keep women out of danger is very believable. And I almost wonder if RJ invented the maidens as a way to pay honor to the soldier that it truly traumatized him to kill and exercise that demon some by making these women warriors who are so incredibly tough and worthy and so obviously not non-combatants. They're just as good as male warriors and truthfully better than most. Yet still his protagonist struggles to see them so or at least refuses to acknowledge that it makes a difference. After Moraine goes through the doorway with Lanfear, Sulin confronts Rand and has her come to Jesus talk with him where she's like, you're going to go to Camelon on this raid and you've asked men from every society to come with you. Men, fuckface. And she tells him, look, you either let us in on this action and treat us like we're supposed to be treated or if we can't do our fucking jobs, we're all going to commit ritual suicide. And it would have been a lot better if once Rand has that talk with Sulin, he managed to have some kind of growth or attitude adjustment where he managed to change it tears me up when women die to I suffer when non-combatants die. And instead of bemoaning how he never could have killed Lanfear and it's all his fault, but oh well, he couldn't have done differently, have a serious moment of growth where he thinks to himself, if I had only bale-fired Lanfear instead of being like, but she's a woman then none of this other fuckery would have happened, so maybe I'll learn from that mistake. But RJ needed or wanted an easy, oh no, we're totally fucked moment. There's all along been the sense of the world may get to a point where we're better off without the dragon, and he wanted an easy line to market where he's just kind of like, Rand decides it's okay to kill women, and at that point we know he's too far gone. And Rand in this book acknowledges the noble woman that he kills in book three. The noble woman that RJ can't go back and edit out once he realizes he's going to run with this device of, okay, we'll know that the world's fucked once he's like, okay, yeah, I guess I can kill women. And so he just has Rand think about it and be like, oh no, the memory of this is making me determined not to kill women. Because he doesn't do a good job with it. In fact, I said in my episode Bad Dragon that if Rand reflected on killing the noble woman and thought about his mental state while he did it, which is much more degraded in book three than it is in books four and five, he could think about the fact that he was kind of crazy back then, or that he was having, like, wild thoughts, basically a manic episode, and dealing with crazy shit, you know, not sleeping, having the Forsaken chasing him in his dreams, whatever, where he could ask himself even, like, was that real? Was it a dream? I don't know. Something, rather than just... I remember this woman's head rolling on the ground, but I'm not going to engage with that anymore. But RJ said that he didn't hesitate in shooting the woman, just as Rand doesn't hesitate in cutting the head off the noble woman. And maybe RJ never could have done it again. And that's the struggle that he's had in going forth with this. So maybe I'm not being fair. Maybe Jordan's exploring something here where he's thinking, if I could have gone back, I would have done differently. Which I don't feel like is reasonable, but you cannot argue against someone's trauma and how they feel, especially having been conditioned their whole life to see women as non-combatants and how he felt so terrible having done it. But when it comes to Rand decides it's okay to kill women and so we're screwed and having that just be a sharp line of demarcation, that's lazy writing. It's lazy writing and utterly unnecessary because Rand bail-firing Natron's Barrow Presuming that's a Jordan's choice and not a Brandon Sanderson choice, and I'm pretty sure it's a Jordan's choice because I think Jordan had completely outlined Rand's arc through book 12. Bale firing Natron's Barrow is all you need to know, oh, this is not good. This is not good at all. At the point where he's callously wiping out non-combatants in a situation where there's not a super tactical purpose for it, like, he'll kill his own men in the battle before Kyrian, where they have to be able to get the gate shut so the Shido can't get into the city, and so he lightning zaps a whole group of people in front of the gate, killing Shido and some of his own. But there's no super tactical purpose for Bale firing Natron's Barrow. And his idea that, oh, well, it was a kindness, that's enough to know, oh no, this isn't great. Or even having Luce Theron screaming in his head, kill us, you need to kill us, we need to die, we'll destroy the world again. You know, anything but this clumsy bullshit of... I can't kill women. I will complicate so much to keep from killing women. I'll have this list that I flagellate myself with 
It's so extra, and it's so over the top, he just leaned into it way too much, and it makes Rant insufferable in certain ways, where it's just, no, it's too much. And it's like RJ is such a talented writer in so many different ways that when he bombs, he bombs hard, and it kind of takes you out of the moment. And people have insufferable personality traits. No lie, I've got fuck tons, but Rand has an insufferable personality trait just by showing a lack of empathy, where he's thinking to himself, I felt like the Maidens would understand because my feelings matter more than their feelings, or my culture and what I want matters more than theirs and what they want, and giving him some personal growth rather than having him act like a baby constantly would be so much better. So that said, I really appreciate how the Maidens turn it back on him. When he's like, okay, we've got this tower built with the spy glasses on it that can see Kyrie Anne from five miles away, and Avienda and Egwene are going to go up there and channel to help the battle, and the Maidens will go guard the tower because he wants to keep them out of the battle. And then the Maidens are like, we're going to guard you at the tower, and he's like, but I want to go out into the battle and look for Kuladin and have a one-on-one -on -one duel with him because he's an asshole. And they're just like, Bardar I Smy carries the honor of the Karakarn. And so he's basically forced to go to the tower, where it's the best place for him to go anyway. And they emotionally blackmail him, where Sulin says, if you don't give us the opportunity to be what we are, what are we supposed to do? Yeah, we'll off ourselves, which leaves Rand feeling like he's got no choice. And she tells him, we all have choices. And when he keeps doing it and keeps acting like an asshole about it, they beat the shit out of him. One of my favorite scenes, especially as Rand gets more and more uncomfortable to read as he gets colder and darker, is the scene in Book 8 where they kick him in the balls and then punch the shit out of him because he went off to battle and left them behind. And good for them. If RJ really wanted to emphasize that Rand suffers when maidens die, then he should have painted more little vignettes, showing relationships with them, showing that he had friendships or closeness with them, and not having him be so annoyed by them. Have him appreciate the soup that Linamel brings him, or any of the cute things they do, just to show that, hey, these women have grown to matter. He cares about them a lot, and so they're closer to him than others. They're some of the only people he feels safe with, some of the only people he really trusts, some of the few that he can be his true self around. And so it's not that he's so angry when maidens die because they're women, but because they are his spear sisters and his spear mothers and the members of his society. That would have worked a lot better, because it can still be a flaw to infantilize the people you care about and try to keep them from harm, and it's much more human and has more depth and feeling than just, women die and I torture myself, and if I ever stop, you're all doomed! I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Podcast of the Dragon. The holidays slowed the making of this one, unfortunately. I love this shit out of Christmas and find it quite distracting. Also, I was sick. Twice. I'll try for a smaller gap between episodes next time, but I've got some major upheaval in my life going on right now, so no can do with promises. My rough drafts are now available on Patreon. They'll be uploaded two to three weeks, or in the case of this one, five weeks, before the final, and you'll be able to see how it improved, what I added, and what I cut out. If you'd like to support the show and have access to that or other fun content, there's a link in the show notes. There are other links to my Discord, to my email, to the Watt Trivia and Games Discord, and to the Watt Fan and Calendar Discord, and there's a link to my YouTube. You should go and subscribe, as well as to my Twitter handle, at Pod of the Dragon. There's also a link to Apple Podcasts. I'm going to beg for reviews at the end of this episode, as well as at the beginning, because they will help other people find me. And so will word of mouth. So if you know anyone who likes the Wheel of Time and might be interested in a different kind of podcast, please tell them about me. My music is by Kevin McLeod. My name is Morgan. And Rand might be a sturdy six foot six, but he also rarely drinks, so I call bullshit on him being able to pound ten shots of Usquai. <laughs>